of those lights are bright. <laughs> All righty. Well, welcome to part five of our 10-part series, Through the Spirit. Uh, Same with me. Okay, you can throw them up here and let's say them together. So, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All right, I was sharing those with my grandson earlier, and I was talking about how this morning I'm doing patience. I said, patience, that's kind of hard. He said, yeah, and self-control, that's kind of hard. <laughs> I mean, he's eight years old, and he's, he's got it. He's figured it out, you know. That's what I need help with, right? Uh, I, I, who does self-control? Katie does self-control? Katie does self-control later on. I, I, I don't know much about self-control. I'm still working on that, all right? But anyway, we're, we're on the fourth one tonight. Anyway, and, and tonight. Today, we won't be here that long. Okay, <laughs> trust me. But uh, remembering that what we what we've said all along is that we believe that that the fruit of the spirit is what true spiritual maturity is all about. You know, there there's other things. You know, Bible knowledge and theology and spiritual gifts that people you know seem to make a lot of, and, and we understand the importance of all of those things. But if you really want to know whether spiritual maturity is something that is growing in your life, look at the fruit of the Spirit. And if you see those things present and growing in your life, you know you're growing into spiritual maturity. Because these are the things that Paul was talking about in Ephesians 4, 13, when he spoke about growing up to the mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ. He's talking about the Christian life is us being molded into the image of Jesus. And spiritual maturity is is simply the the character of Jesus being woven into the fabric of our own being through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the clearest expression of that that I know of is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So anyway, this morning we're going to look at the fourth one of these. There's love, joy, peace, patience. Patience, okay, patience. <laughs> All right, gotcha, never mind. <laughs> uh, I think maybe the best way to start on this is, is something by way of definition, to try to uh, not the. Def- Fine, but somehow describe what patience is all about. Uh, I, I, I think all of us, you know, when we, we look at the list and we, we see patience pop up, it's like, oh man, that's the tough one. That's the one I, I, I'm scared to pray about <laughs> for fear what comes my way to, to experience it. But we tend to think about patience in terms of waiting for something, but not just waiting for something, waiting for something without popping a cork, okay? And and, uh, I I mean that figuratively, (laughs) but sometimes maybe literally, right? (laughs) You know, (laughs) waiting without popping a cork, never mind, okay. But, you know, we, we think that in terms of showing some kind of restraint when faced with either something... Uh, or maybe more often someone who is difficult and trying, you know. And I think that's not a, a bad place to start in thinking about what, what patience is and understanding biblical patience. As long as we understand it, it's more than just passively putting in time. You know, patience is waiting, but it's more than just putting in time. It's, it's not waiting for the phone to ring or class to be over or the rain to stop or cooler weather to come back or for my ship to come in. It's not just waiting for something. It, in the New Testament, it, it actually uses two different words to capture our English idea of patience. That word patience in English, there's two words in Greek that kind of work at getting that. And so, hey, I, I'm I teach Greek, right? And, you know, it's word study time this morning. We're going to look at the Bible a lot this morning. Uh, 
<sighs> man, I, I, I realized this was, you know, the kids are with me today. Oh my goodness, maybe this wasn't the best day for this, but hang with me anyway, okay? Be patient with me. There we go. Uh, but anyway, these two words, they uh, sometimes seem to be used interchangeably, but I, I, I detect a difference in the two words. The, the first one is ipomoni, from the word uh, ipomaneo. Anyway, it, it, it comes from two words which have a basic meaning of remaining under something. Uh, Staying, you know, there, a, a load that we carry, but, but kind of staying there with it. Epo under men, meno, to abide, you know, Jesus says, abide in me. It's, it's kind of sticking with it, even when, when the load is there and it seems to be hard. You know, the resulting meaning for us, uh, in, in terms of the way that word is translated in our Bible, sometimes it's translated endurance enduring things. Sometimes it's translated steadfastness. Uh, sometimes it's translated perseverance, you know, hanging in there. I, I, I use that word, what, I, did I coin this word a few weeks ago? stick to <laughs> it, It's just kind of sticking with it when, when things are difficult. Paul refers to this in Romans 12, 12, where he says, we rejoice in hope while being patient, and that's an epimeno, while being patient in tribulation. There's a load there. There's things we're dealing with. But we're hanging in there with a sense of hope. God's got something planned in this and through this, and I'm going to trust in that. I'm going to rejoice in my hope because I know God is not going to waste this experience in my life. I'm going to hang in here and let God do what he wants to do in this set of circumstances, hanging in there despite the difficulties. Uh, it's what love does. <laughs> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, he says, love endures all things. He uses that word, if I'm in it. It remains even when things get hard. And then in Hebrews 10, 32, the writer of the letter of the Hebrews, writing to Jewish people in Rome who've, who've been suffering and dealing with stuff, says, but recall the former days, he says, when you endured, when you stuck in there under that heavy load of a hard struggle with sufferings, hanging in there, uh, enduring. And then uh, more of a classic here, Hebrews 12, 2 speaks of Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured, Ipa Mano, endured the cross. <clears throat> he carried a heavy load all the way to the end for us. Um, it's a good word. And then there's the word makarthumia. Makrathimia, on the other hand, it, it comes from two words which carry the idea of being long-nosed. <laughs> it's like, whoa, what's that all about? I, I, I think, you know, it seems like originally it implied something like long breath. <laughs> uh, the best way I know to describe it is, you know, holding your breath for a bit before responding. You know, something happens. <gasps> okay, <laughs> now let me deal with it. <laughs> kind of that, that little bit of pause. Uh, by the time of the New Testament writers, it carried with it the ideas of being long-suffering. Carrying, you know, putting up with something over a long period, suffering with something. Uh, it carried with it the idea of forbearance. Carried with it the idea, our word, patience, waiting for things. Uh, being to, able to stand up under provocation. Okay, it's NBA finals start this week. Okay, so poster boy 
for, for this would be Tim Duncan when Kevin Garnett is sitting there trash talking the living daylights out of Tim. And Tim just looks at Kevin and, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, it's being able to hang in there under provocation <laughs> and not react, not respond. Showing restraint in the midst of, in the face of opposition or oppression. It's kind of been compared to the idea of letting your motor idle when you really want to strip the gears. <laughs> you want, mm, I want to do something about this. I want to take control of this. I am sick and tired of this. But letting the engine idle just a little while longer. Letting God do what God wants to do in this set of circumstances. Because I know he's up to something. And yes, I've been walking around these walls for a bit, and I thought that they would have tumbled down by now. I love that in the song that we sang earlier. You know, it's, it's, it's I, I, I can't just strip the gears. I need to sit here and, and let it idle for a little bit. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul, recalling his rebellion against God, says, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, Paul, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. The idea is the full extent of his long suffering, his macrothemia with me. Paul, who had hated Jesus, Paul, who had persecuted Christians, Paul, who, thinking back over, I'm sure he's sitting there thinking, I should have been put down like the mad dog that I was, but Jesus didn't do that. He suffered long with me. So Tim Duncan, no, no, no. Scratch Tim Duncan's face. Jesus, yeah. Jesus, the poster child. The poster boy for what long suffering with us is. The things that he put up with, Paul would say. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient. He is long-suffering towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would come, should reach repentance. God, in response to a rebellious lost world, <laughs> God, in response to sometimes rebellious his own kids, <laughs> us, God being so patient, long-suffering with us. Uh, again, it's what love does. <laughs> love is patient, Paul says. 1 Corinthians 13.4, long-suffering. It shows restraint instead of reacting. It suffers long. Oh, and so the way that these two words are used in the New Testament, Testament, you know, they're very similar, and, and yet I think I can detect a possible difference. And that difference would, would come at the point of the, so, uh, the, the object of restraint here. Epimony seems to be used more in response to difficult circumstances, enduring, being steadfast, staying under the load. It's, that's difficult circumstances that come my way. Where macrothumia seems to be more, have more in mind the idea of dealing with difficult people. <laughs> ah, pesky people. Yeah, our world is kind of full of both. You know, we live in a broken, fallen world. And things are messed up and people are messed up and Truth of the matter is, we're messed up, <laughs> but we show a lot more patience with ourselves maybe than we do most people. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. You know, God shows us patience. Okay? You know? But anyway, um, 
I think, I, I think somewhat of a difference here, and, and if we could explore that, maybe that difference a little further. You know, Paul, I think, is dealing with this difference in First, first Thessalonians 1.14. He says, we boast about you, about the Thessalonians, for your steadfastness, your epo men, money, your steadfastness in all your persecutions and afflictions. So that idea of, of that word talking about staying under, dealing with stuff. But then in 2 Corinthians 6, 4 and 6, he, he kind of breaks from one to the other. He says, but as servants, God talking about himself and those of his colleagues and the things that they have to deal with in life. He says, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. He says, first of all, by great endurance. That's the epimony. And afflictions. And hardships. And calamities. And beatings. And imprisonment in riots and labors, in sleepless nights, in hunger. Yeah, we s stick with it. Being faithful to God in those kinds of circumstances. But then I think he switches over to talk about relationships with people, where he says by purity, by knowledge, ah, and that word, by patience, long suffering, where he's dealing with people. So endurance with circumstances Patience with people. I think hard, fast rule, ah, not really. But the two words are kind of there. And, you know, we look, we look elsewhere in the New Testament and we see James. At first it looks like, well, maybe James is dealing with something a little different here. In James 5, 7, he says, be patient. Uh, Makrothumia, be patient, therefore, brothers. Until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit from the earth. Being patient. Long suffering with, uh, until, uh, about it until it receives the early and, and later rains. It, it almost seems like, you know, he's just simply talking about, you know, putting in time. You think about waiting for the crop to grow, you know, you've done all you could do, and now you're waiting for the crop to grow. I, I was a pastor in a farming community for years, and there is no such thing as doing nothing as a farmer. <laughs> a farmer's life is always filled with something. <laughs> but that idea of waiting here, you know, it, it almost sounds like just kind of waiting and putting it on time, but then, then he steps into verses 8 through 11. And he, he, he seems to be, at this point, at least consistent with what, what I've been talking about, about the difference. He says, you also be patient. And there he's using the word mocker through me. You be patient. And, and then he says, do not grumble against one another. Wow. Being patient, long-suffering. He's talking about people here, isn't he? Don't grumble. Pesky people, people who talk too much, <laughs> or people who don't talk enough. <laughs> you know. Who do you get most impatient with? <laughs> you know. uh, people who may not reciprocate your kindness. People who neglect or ignore the contributions that you make. People who try to use us. People who talk behind our backs. Oh, man, this is the tough one from people who cut in front of us on the highway <laughs> or in the, the line at the grocery store, okay? You know, I don't, those people don't bother me as much as those who cut me off in traffic. Um, this guy does that one day, and his bumper sticker said, Real men love Jesus. And I, oh, real men who love Jesus don't cut people off in traffic. And my wife says to me, I think real men who love Jesus don't grumble at people who cut them off and trap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, this partner God gave me. <laughs> right. He says, don't grumble. He, he says, as an example of suffering and patience, long-suffering patience, take the prophets, he says, who spoke the word of the Lord. Prophets dealt with 
ungrateful, obstinate people who really didn't want to hear what they said. You know, the prophets were called, and they stood up and they spoke for God. And what they said wasn't, was rarely ever appreciated. But they hung in there, didn't they? And so there is a sense of them suffering long and also them remaining steadfast. He says, behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Epomeni, <laughs> the other word that Paul uses. He said, you've heard of this steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. So anyway, Paul, I think, has both of these ideas in mind when he talks to us about the fruit of the Spirit being patient. Uh, he, he certainly finds it easy to put these two words together and does often in his work. Um, in, in 2 Timothy 3, 10 and 11, he says, You, however, you followed my teaching, talking to Timothy, his, his, men, his mentor, okay? He says, You follow my teaching, my conduct, my aim in faith, my, my faith, my patience, my makrithumia, my love and my steadfastness, my epomeni. These two things just go together in life, my persecutions and suffering, which I epomenied, <laughs> which I endured. Same word there. One of, the most, one of the most amazing sentences in all the New Testament, for me, it, you know, where Paul puts together another, I think, holy trinity <laughs> of words, where he writes to the Colossians in Colossians 1, 9, 11, he says, and so... From the day we heard, first heard about you, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as, <coughs> pardon me, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, wouldn't that be nice, eh? Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, hey, those are wonderful things. But then he says, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, to what end? To be strengthened with his power according to his glory. To what end, Paul? For all endurance, epa many, and patience, makrothumia, with joy. Kara, since I'm quoting Greek, okay, kara. Where in the world could you put those three words together in the same sentence? I, I, I mean, we, we would expect them on the same page. We wouldn't expect them on the same chapter of the book. But endurance and patience with joy joy. But that's what Paul says. And it, it, what does it take to be strengthened with all <laughs> with all power according to his glorious might. The only way I'll ever experience endurance sticking with it and <laughs> long suffering and dealing with circumstances and people with joy, the only way that will ever happen, all three of those together, is for God to show up in my life and do something in me that I cannot do for myself. Do we get the picture here that biblical patience is something that I cannot pull off on my own? <laughs> if, if that is going to be a picture of my life, then I'm going to need God's Holy Spirit to do some amazing things in me. So anyway, what is this patience that Paul says is a product of the Holy Spirit within us? Patience is a God-given, <laughs> spirit-empowered ability to remain faithful to his purposes in our lives, despite difficult circumstances or difficult people or both. Because, hey, sometimes they all come together, don't they? 
It's a steady, peaceful restraint that refuses to give up, blow up, crack up, pull out when we feel that God has called us to be engaged. Uh, I recognize that there are some times, there are some relationships, there, there are some situations in life where God's Spirit would tell us, just walk away. Jesus told his disciples, you go somewhere, they don't want to hear what you have, just shake the dust off your feet and head on down the road. There are situations like that. Diane's got a book, uh, When to Walk Away. Is that the name of that book, Diane? Something like that, you know. And, and it talks about, there are some times that, that that's what we need to do. <laughs> Trouble is, there's a lot of times in life where I, we can't walk away, right? It's people, but they're family. <laughs> it's people, but they're people I work with. I can't just walk away. And maybe a helpful resource for that is a book by Cloud and Townsend called Boundaries. A really, really good resource on how do I set good boundaries when I'm having to deal in toxic situations. How do I set good boundaries so that I don't go crazy? <laughs> But in all of that, we need something that only God can provide, and that's this business called patience. Like the patient farmer who does what he's called to do and then waits for God to do what only God to do, trusting that God will do it all in his good time. <laughs> Biblical patience, trust in the hidden power of God to accomplish his will. And I think it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't do that solo. Uh, Long-suffering patience doesn't show up solo. It comes as part of a course. It comes as sort of a package kind of a deal. Listen to what Paul says in, in Ephesians uh, 4, 1 to 3. He said, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility. Probably a good thing. Gentleness, yeah, with, in, in my respect, <laughs> with patience, bearing with one another in love, ah. suffering long with love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's similar passages in Colossians 3, 12 and 14. He says, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Makrithimia, suffering long, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint, because <laughs> some days we do, right? If one has a complaint, forgiving one another as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Are you getting the picture of what biblical patience is? If you're still curious, okay. <laughs> Take a look at Jesus. Go to your Gospels. Look at how Jesus deals with people in his life. Look at how he suffers long with the disciples, trying to get some truth through their thick heads, you know. Think of, you know, I, Thomas, have I been with you so long you hadn't got, you know, when you've seen me, you've seen the, come on, Tom. <laughs> this is important. This is my, I came to reveal the Father and you still hadn't seen him yet. Look at me, Tom. Here's the Father, Tom. 
Jesus on his way to the cross, looking for someone to step into that with him and, and wait with him. And the disciples are sitting there arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Come on, guys. Jesus' patience with them. Uh, we see him wrestling with the Pharisees. And, you know, we're so used to him, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, calling them out and, you know, fussing at them. We're so used to that, we forget that that's late in Jesus' ministry, early in Jesus' ministry. Jesus is extremely patient and long-suffering with them, respectful to these guys. He says, come on, guys, read your Bible, stop and think about it. And it's only as they persist in their attack upon attack, that Jesus finally, okay, guys, <laughs> you've earned this. <laughs> and he gives it to him, but he's been long-suffering all through this. With the fickle crowds who welcome him one day and walk away on another because they don't like what he said. Jesus feeds them. They like that. They show up for more, and he says, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood and there, he's talking about living in a dependent relationship on me, but they're just hearing the words thinking, icky poo, we're done with you. And they're walking away. But Jesus, having the compassion that he does with the crowd, with a woman at the well, how he's so patient. And he keeps pressing her deeper and deeper and deeper to help her come to a discovery of who he is. He is awesome with Pilate, who boasts his power over Jesus. Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or to release you? <laughs> Jesus says, Pilate, you got no power at all, buddy. I got 10,000 legions of angels that I could call on right now and rescue me, but I won't because it's the Father's will that I take up this cross and bear this cross to the end. So, Pilate, that's what I'm going to do. We see Jesus. If we would have... His character woven into the fabric of our being. Well, we're going to have to learn to be patient. And, and <laughs> that's not going to be something we do on our own. Let me tell two quick stories and then I'll be done, I promise. Uh, the, these two stories popped into my head. One of them was from a long time ago. I was pastor in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. I'd gone down to Saskatoon, 90 miles away to visit some of the house. So on my home, it's winter time, it's cold. There's a guy at Rostron, which is halfway between Saskatoon and PA, a guy at Rostron trying to hitch a ride in the cold. Well, you know, being the good Christian I am, right? <laughs> I pull over, let him get in, and, and we take off. It, and this man is, he's the most foul mouth, potty mouth, toilet mouth, I'd never been around anything quite that bad in all my life. I'm going down the road, and it's just, you know, and finally it's like, you know, hey, I need to offer him something. I said, hey, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a pastor in Prince Albert, and, you know, I'm just not accustomed to listening to the kind of language that, you know, you're spewing out here. And, uh, I really would appreciate it if you just kind of tone that down a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm not expecting you to never send other cars, you know, but if you just tone that down a little bit. Oh, hell yeah, I said. <laughs> <laughs> and if he toned it down, I didn't notice. <laughs> but he had that kind of, I'm so proud of myself for, for, for have me cleaned up my act. I mean, he's thinking he's doing well. It sounds the same to me. And I'm thinking, being the good Christian that I am, right? I'm thinking, where's the nearest farmhouse that I can drop him off on this side of the road? And if he gets too cold, he can go in and not freeze to death in the farmer's house, right? 
Where can I drop him off? Because I'm tired of this. I don't want to put up with this anymore. I remember God saying so clearly to me. He said, Bill, I've been putting up with this guy for 45 years. Do you suppose you could put up with him for 45 minutes? And then there was a four, fourth grader. I did a stint as a teacher, please, not my finest season in life, okay? Junior high, oh my, hell is a junior high and excessively wicked people have to substitute teach there. That's all I can say about junior high. But I ended up with fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and a little fourth grader. And if I, I knew some of his story, and, and so I recognized where all of the turmoil in this little boy's life was going to be, home environment. But he was so hard to deal with, you know, and if there weren't children in the room, I would tell you that I, some days I want to just twist his little head off. But since there's kids in the room, I won't mention that, right? <laughs> Being the good Christian that I am. <laughs> but it was, I would get so frustrated with him. I don't know that I was talking to Jesus, but I was going over, you know, how hard it was to deal with him in my head, and, you know, Jesus kind of popped up. He said, Bill, do you love me? Well, Jesus, you know I love you. Of course I love you. I love you very much. He said, Bill, would you take this love that you have for me, and would you center that love in this little boy and love him for my sake. Your love for me that you would center on him and love him for my sake. Changed my attitude that day. You know what his name was? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. I'm not saying that it's easy putting up either with difficult circumstances or difficult people. But when, when I'm dealing with difficult circumstances in life, more often than not, Jesus just simply says to me, Bill, just trust me. And when I'm dealing with difficult people in my life, he says, Bill, just love them. And when I'm dealing with both at the same time, he says something along the line of, I thought you told me I could use your life any way I wanted to. <laughs> but in all of that, as we lean into Jesus, as we're engaged with the people in the world that he would have us engaged with, let's be engaged with his spirit too. And let his spirit weave into the fabric of our being his own character, which is long-suffering and sticking under the load. Father, ah, it's easier to just pray for peace, God. <laughs> but with your peace, we would long to be patient. For Jesus' sake. And in his name we pray. God bless you.